Welcome one and all. It's so great to see so many people joining us this morning. My name is Eric Steinhoff. I'm a member of the faculty at the Evergreen State College. I've taught here since 2013, and I'm very excited to um, introduce today's event, which is co-sponsored by the Climate Justice and Resilience Speaker Series and the Reimagining Community Safety series. Um, I'll pop some links into the chat. Um, we've got a wonderful event today with Jeff Antonellis Lapp, the author of an incredible new book um, on Tahoma, Mount Rainier, Tahoma and its people. Um, I'll say more about that in a moment. This event is also co-sponsored by the Masters in Environmental Studies program. We're very grateful for their support. And I wanted to also say thank you to the media services team with Raul Berman, um, and also to Julie Ron, who helped with some of the paperwork for this event. I'll say a few words of introduction, and then we'll um, hand things over to today's distinguished guest. I wanted to begin the day with a solemn acknowledgement. I wanted to acknowledge that the Evergreen State College is situated on territory that was dispossessed or stolen from indigenous people. Those of us who reside in the southernmost reach of the Salish Sea are living on the ancestral lands of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, which include the Squaxin Island Tribe, the Nisqually Indian Tribe, and the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. The 1854 treaty ceding these lands has been the subject of incredible struggle and resistance, and also of unprecedented transformation. These treaty tribes are all still in this area, actively engaged with the land and their communities. All who are not indigenous are visitors here. We recognize the traditional custodians of these lands and pay respect to elders past and present. We celebrate indigenous sovereignty and self-determination and acknowledge that there is much more work to be done in this respect. Um, land acknowledgements have become customary for events of this sort at Evergreen. But there's an extra element of appropriateness today because the book that Jeff Antonellis Lapp will be discussing um, actively considers the dynamic relationship between um, our bioregion and its natural history and its cultural history. Um, I also wanted to express gratitude to the Chehalis tribe who contributed a vaccine clinic in collaboration with Evergreen Student Wellness Services earlier, um, earlier this quarter. And one last word by way of acknowledgement, I wanted to say, George Floyd, presente. When Black Lives Matter, everybody lives better. When Black Lives Matter, everybody lives better. So today's event is focused on the Nisqually watershed. We'll have a virtual field trip led by a irreplaceable guide, Jeff Antonellis Lapp. If I had my way, we'd be in buses right now, winding our way up the slopes of Tahoma, heading to the snowpack and trying to figure out how to put our snowshoes on. The last time I was on Mount Rainier was with Jeff Antonellis Lapp with a group of students. We did a field trip. Um, we took our notebooks, we took our snowshoes, we took our sunscreen, we still got sunburnt. Um, we can't do those field trips yet, but they will come back. They will come back and this book will be a invaluable resource as we begin to plan that kind of work in, in, the, months, um, in the months and years to come. Um, Jeff taught at Evergreen for many, many years, and I want to offer a few um, sentences uh, by way of biography. This comes from um, the back page of the new book, which is called Tahoma and Its People, and Jeff will be able to say some more words by way of introduction himself. After graduating from Western Washington University's Huxley College of the Environment, with a BS in environmental education, Jeff Antonellis Lapp began a 37 year career teaching in outdoor programs and teaching science. He later earned a master's in education in science education from the University of Washington. As a faculty member at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Jeff taught on Western Washington Indian reservations for 10 years 
before teaching environmental education, natural history, and writing on campus. He retired as emeritus faculty in 2015. Seasonal work at Mount Rainier in the late 1970s ignited his connection to the mountain that endures today. He has climbed it, hiked all of the parks, mapped trails, and completed the Wonderland Trail six times. Jeff and his wife, Valerie, reside in Enumclaw, where they raised their two children. And I'll offer just one last piece before I hand things over to Jeff. When Jeff visited the class that I was teaching, he offered a remarkable phrase in relation to peer review, in relation to getting feedback from your contemporaries on your work. Jeff said, I can't see what I can't see. And so I need to work with others to understand what it is that I've put on the page. I really appreciate the time that Jeff has taken today and I'll hand things over, welcoming Jeff Antonella Slap back to the Evergreen State College. Woohoo! thank you. Thank you, Eric. Hello everybody, so good to be with you. Really, what a treat, what a pleasure. I'm, special thanks, uh, Eric, to you for your, introduction also to Rachel Rachel for your work behind the scenes and helping me get comfortable and getting set up really appreciate that Raul and the tech team you are uh, amazing again I've worked with you before and uh, thank you for your good work also um, I'm really honored to be asked to speak with you today actually I'm, we're going to take a trip together if that's okay with you uh, honored to be doing that I'm honored to be part of the finale of the speaker series for the year uh, in, in these important times. And, and before we continue, I, I want to say just a special words to uh, particularly the students, uh, the staff, and, and the faculty. I don't have any idea how hard you've been working, you know, in the last year, but I know spending my whole life as a student and a teacher, that's a lot of work to begin with. And when you factor in, you know, the pandemic and the challenges and all those other things that have been piled on, top. Um, it must be pretty daunting. And I really salute uh, your resilience, uh, all of you, and uh, you're hanging in there and being here today. Uh, what wonderful work. And it looks like uh, the clouds are starting to break. It looks like uh, the tide is turning in our favor and uh, hoping that things are on their way back to something that feels like life before the pandemic. So again, thank you for your good hard work and hanging in there and your determination, really good stuff. So uh, yeah, let's, let's get to some, let's get to the slide deck. Let's get to some images. And uh, so as, uh, as Eric has said, I am inviting you to join me on a field trip to Mount Rainier National Park today. That's where we'll start. We're going to uh, take a trip from the mountain all the way down to the Salish Sea, down to where the Nisqually River empties into uh, Puget Sound at Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. Most of these stories that I'm going to share with you today are from my natural history of Mount Rainier called Tahoma and its people. It uh, was published last year by Washington State University Press. And uh, you might know that Tahoma is one of uh, several Native American names uh, for the mountain. And if you'd like to know more about that, I can talk about what I understand to be the meanings and different pronunciations and those sorts of things. By all means, just um, put that in the uh, Q&A feature and we'll get to that at the end of the talk, all right? Um, also, just by way of beginnings, I, I wanna fill in a couple of the blank spots uh, from Eirik's fabulous introduction. And that is that, as he said, um, when I finished my undergraduate degree at, at Huxley College, I worked a couple of seasons uh, at Mount Rainier as a seasonal, and that really kind of inoculated me uh, with mountain fever, if you will. And uh, then moving to Enumclaw, uh, basically from Enumclaw, Mount Rainier is a person's extended backyard. And uh, so those things really led me to having a lifetime relationship with uh, with the mountain. And uh, then I was uh, offered a job to teach for the Muckleshoot Indian tribe. And uh, I was invited onto the reservation in Auburn, Washington, not far from my home. And I was there to teach, but uh, to tell you the truth, I, I 
pretty sure I learned a lot more from folks than they learned from me. And because of their kindness, uh, because of the generosity of the, of the people at Muckleshoot, I was able to study Holshootseed. Now, Holshootseed is a Southern dialect of the Lashootseed language. Echof siaya. Echof siaya. Hello, friend. Hello, friend. This is one of the original languages of Puget Sound Country, full shoot seed. And these folks from here, my language teacher, Donna Starr, who is an Evergreen graduate, uh, a respected elder of the tribe, she told me that her ancestors would have been able to speak uh, with folks from Nisqually, from Puyallup, from Squaxin. They spoke uh, pretty much all full shoot seed, uh, very similar dialects. So, also because of the kindness of the folks at Muckleshoot, they took me into the forest and they taught me how to gather uh, Western red cedar bark. This is really hard work. And uh, I also did some red cedar bark collecting uh, with Yvonne Peterson, uh, a member of the Evergreen faculty. Uh, we actually got permission to clear some of the red cedar bark uh, before uh, the SEM2 building went up. Uh, years ago. And uh, this is really hard work to uh, pull the bark off the trees. I learned uh, through Yvonne and other folks how to prepare it, even did a little bit of weaving. And sharing this cultural knowledge with me, I think, helped prepare me for learning the stories and telling the stories of uh, Native people and their ancestors uh, going to Tahoma, now that we know they've been going there for thousands of years. And I've got a little bit more to say about that, of course, too. But during my time at Muckleshoot, uh, folks on the tribal council asked me if I could help them find a way to help tribal members graduate from college. They had a lot of folks uh, at Muckleshoot with one or two years of college under their belt and no place to really go to complete their degree. And so at their encouragement, I forged a relationship with, ta -da, the Evergreen State College. I did a little reaching out. I met Dr. Carol Minu, who at that time was directing what we called the reservation-based community-determined program. And Carol had been driving the Indian reservations in Western Washington for some years with a, a box of books in the trunk of her car and teaching class to folks on site at their reservations. And uh, with Evergreen's cooperation and the Muckleshoot Tribe's blessing, we started a reservation-based program at Muckleshoot in the fall of 1998. And both Evergreen and Muckleshoot looked at me and said, well, we think you're probably the best person. Actually, they probably meant you're probably the only person uh, that's available to do this. So they asked me to teach and that began my relationship uh, with the Evergreen State College that lasted for the better part of about 17 or 18 years. When I uh, eventually left the reservation-based program after 10 years and and moved on to the uh, Olympia daytime curriculum, I was planning to teach a course on Mount Rainier. And I thought, well, this would be great. I, I know a little bit about Mount Rainier for Pete's sakes, and uh, it would be fun to teach a class. I uh, was instructed to, to get with Carolyn Dobbs, who had taught classes at Mount Rainier uh, with Willie Unsold, like back in the day, in Evergreen's early days. And uh, Carolyn uh, obliged that she would teach a quarter with me. And I thought, man, it would be great to really find a good book about the natural history, you know, the plant and animal communities, maybe a little bit of the cultural history of Mount Rainier. And lo and behold, I could not find the book, nor could our tenacious reference librarians. They couldn't find the book either. And so one day, a, a, a friend of mine, Bill Ransom, a uh, member of the faculty, said to me, well, dummy, you know what that means. I said, no, what? He said, it means that you're the guy who's supposed to write the book. So that began this adventure of writing Tahoma and its people. It took me 10 years. And I just want to say a thanks to so many students, staff, faculty, members of the administration who supported my work over the years. Uh, financially, I, I was able to uh, get financial support to uh, support my habit, I mean, my research. Uh, also, uh, students and staff and faculty read drafts, provided feedback. I attended Write That Book workshops with my uh, faculty peers. So many things that have just helped me so much uh, in putting the book together. And there's one more group of people that I want to make sure to, uh, to mention here that was just been so important to me. And these are the folks with the National Park Service 
particularly the staff and scientists at Mount Rainier National Park. People like Scott Beeson and Paul Kennard, who I would say in addition to maybe Ken Tabbitt and Abir Biswas, are probably among my favorite rockheads, my favorite geologists. And these guys drug me onto glaciers, including, here's a shot on the Nisqually Glacier, to take measurements, help them take measurements, to help me understand what's going on with the mountain in terms of climate change. I also uh, was befriended by the aquatics team and they drug me uh, into some alpine lakes that don't even have names. Some of these lakes don't even have established trails into them. And they helped me understand a little bit of the aquatic ecology of Mount Rainier and how that fits in to the bigger picture of the mountains ecosystems. These are some cascade frogs that I took a picture of at uh, Aurora Lake on the Wonderland Trail uh, a year ago. Uh, actually, I was hiking with an evergreen intern and I wanna make sure to mention to you that with Rebecca Lofgren, I uh, coordinate every year an internship program for evergreen students. Undergrads and graduate students have participated in the program. They get a nice stipend and they get the experience of a lifetime uh, living and working at Mount Rainier for about 13 weeks. So if any students are here and are interested in this for the future, you do need to be a current evergreen student, but by all means contact me and I'll get you connected as next year is a possibility. Also, uh, boy, Greg Burchard uh, basically took me under his wing and he said that he would teach me everything I needed to know about the park's archeological record. He involved me, invited me to help out at three different uh, excavations. This is at the Ohanapakash campground. And through Greg, I learned that native people have been going up to Mount Rainier for over 9,000 years mostly in pursuit of resources that they did not have near their lowland villages. They went for other reasons as well, but we think primarily they went to, to access resources. And I'll talk a little bit about that soon too. So all of these people have given me so many stories, so much to talk about, but today I'm inviting you to join me on a very specific trip in the Nisqually watershed. So this is a shot from Rick Secker Point. We are within Mount Rainier National Park right now. And I want you to imagine yourself uh, maybe having gotten on uh, our big charter bus with nice plush seats. I think there's probably a working restroom at the back of the bus if you need to take a bio break. And um, we're going to cruise our way up the road up to paradise. And this shot from Rick Secker Point shows right in the center of the photograph, you can see the Nisqually Bridge uh, crossing the river, and we're looking up the Nisqually Valley, up toward the mountain and up toward the Nisqually Glacier. So I would call this a virtual field trip in the Nisqually watershed. We're going to travel basically from Alpine Heights to Salish Sea. And if you want to think of it in another way, this is also could be a, a trip where we're going to travel from the mountain goats down to the gooey ducks. So let's get started. So we're on the bus, we're going together. I hope you've got your lunch with you and uh, the beverage of your choice. Let's take a look as we're cruising up to paradise. Let's take a look at what we're getting ourselves into. We're going to start here uh, within Mount Rainier National Park and we're gonna find our way pretty close to uh, the terminus of the glacier where the river comes out and where the Nisqually River actually begins. Then we're going to follow the river 78 miles through these small towns in the Squally River Valley and come out to where the river empties into Puget Sound at uh, Billy Frank Jr., the Squally National Wildlife Refuge. So before we do anything else, let's pay some honor and respect and learn a little bit about the original inhabitants of this watershed, the Duf Squally Opsh, Duf Squally Opsh, people of the grass, people of the river, the Nisqually people. So there's no record of any year round uh, villages within the confines of Mount Rainier National Park, but there are uh, plenty of villages along uh, the river that I'd like to just share some of the main ones and some of their, their attributes with you. There actually was uh, a village, a year-round village near uh, 
just outside the park near what would be called today Skate Creek. There was a, a Nisqually village near the present day town of Elby. There was a large and important village below what would be today's uh, Alder and the Grand Dams. Uh, the Michelle village is important where the Michelle River empties into uh, the Nisqually for a variety of reasons, not the least of which it was the home village of Leshai, who was the, 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 the noted uh, Nisqually order uh, tribal leader uh, back in the 1850s. And then this village is really important because it's actually, this is a village on Muck Creek where it flows into the Nisqually. This was the home village of Willie Frank. Willie was Billy Frank Jr.'s father. And Willie was this incredible person who was a living cultural bridge, if you will, between the 19th and 20th centuries. Because he had grown up in this village, he had known the old ways of his people, and he shared these openly and willingly with ethnographers and historians. And he filled in so much of what we know in terms of the gaps of the life ways of the Nisqually and the Puyallup people. A real treasure, Willie Frank. And then two villages at the mouth on opposite sides of the river where it empties into the Salish Sea, Swadadab, which I believe uh, translates to like a place of spirit or a, a medicine place. Hence, maybe the name for uh, the ancestral name for Medicine Creek. And the other village, Dusquali, Dusquali, place of hay or place of grass, villages on opposite side. So, although there are no uh, year round villages within the park, we know of at least one really important seasonal camp that was probably used by Nisqually ancestors. And as we're driving up to Paradise today, or the next time you drive up to Paradise through the Nisqually entrance, you might want to stop at the Couts Creek picnic area. And this trail that heads up from Couts Creek, heads up the mountain, just a few miles up uh, is where this site is. And so Nisqually families, and extended families uh, came to this spot uh, when the summer, uh, when the snows had melted back midsummer, and they set up camp here. They camped here and they collected resources, was what they did. And we know now that they were coming here for over 7,000 years. The other thing I want to point out in this photo is that here's Greg. Burchard, the then park archaeologist, now retired. He's actually in a unit doing the work. Can you see that? Got his head down doing the work. Look at most of the rest of us, including yours truly, hands on hips in the traditional loafer pose. And I'll tell you, Greg was just that kind of person to dig, dig in and get after the work himself. And he was so important in what we developing what we know about Mount Rainier and native people. He added over 30 sites alone to the park's archeological record. He designed uh, temporal and spatial models that help us describe and understand where people went on the mountain, when they went there, and when their habits in their, uh, their, their when their habits changed. So Greg Bircher was really been important to the development of the park's understanding of native people. Uh, here's a shot at the same site, uh, and the person in the background I want to point out is Ben Diaz, who is now the current park archaeologist, and Ben continues as a tribal liaison. The park has worked really well the last 20 years to reach out to all of the tribes surrounding Tahoma, to involve them, to learn from them, and to collaborate with them on various projects. So people at these excavations they get their head down. <laughs> they dig a hole. <laughs> they get down in the dirt. These are some students that were participating in a camp sponsored by Central Washington University. Here's a couple of students that are excavating a fire hearth. And now a, a fire hearth is like a treasure chest, all right, of, of information. So here's the completed excavated hearth. So the, the fire pit itself is in the lower right-hand corner. Can you see that? Make that out? Of course, they would find charcoal, right, and fire charred rock, sure. But what if they were to find bones or teeth that were analyzed later and found to have belonged to mountain goat? Turns out mountain goats were highly prized by native people. Their warm wool, their thick hides, 
were something that people went into the high country for probably most every season in pursuit of. The robes and blankets would last generations made from mountain goat wool. How about finding also bones or, oh, oh, oh before I go to the next animal, I wanna just let you know that uh, there's still a really good chance for you to find mountain goats at Mount Rainier if you know where to look. This is a shot I took last summer uh, near Berkeley Park on the mountain's north side. And you'll notice that, that they apparently got the memo. These goats look as if they're social distancing. You can tell that. And I didn't want to get any closer to them. They can be kind of scary up close. Uh, but I was able to get a shot of a couple of prints and some mountain goat scat. Nice close-ups of those. So back to other animals and other things, traces that are found in these fire pits, um, bones that belong to hoary marmot. There's good evidence that these animals, uh, thick pelts were also woven into robes and blankets and that marmots were also on the menu of, in some Native American diets in this region. Folks also went to the high country to collect plants for a whole variety of reasons. You might know bear grass here. This is a member of the lily family. And notice those long skinny leaves at the base of the plant. People collected those and processed them and then used them as imprecation in basket making. So when you see Puget Salish baskets with light designs in them, light colored, many times it might be, it might be bear grass that was used to make the designs. One of the biggest draws, believe it or not, of native people to the high country were huckleberries. Now we could, we could have an argument about mountain blueberries or huckleberries, but the point is that four species of vaccinium were a big draw to people. Of course, they ate them fresh, but they also dried them over low intensity fires and then they would take them back to their villages and use them over the winter months, right? They would rehydrate them, it turns out, you know, huckleberries are a hugely important source of vitamin C in diets, period, and certainly in native diets. So what are the other sorts of things that we find? What do we know? Well, where people went on the mountain, what they, what they carried with them were their stone tools. So they carried with them things like uh, spears. Uh, when bow and arrows came into use, prior to bow and arrow, it would have been an atlatl. Uh, so here's a photograph of some various scrapers, blades, projectile points that have been recovered from various sites at Mount Rainier. Here's a close-up of a projectile point. And I've got to tell you, finding something like this, this is like the grand prize. This is like the best thing ever. And this, the huge minority of things that are found. The majority of what is found at these sites are slivers of stone tooling. So this is material that was brittle, that needed to be reworked frequently. New tools needed to be made all the time. And so people would sit, like you and I would sit around a campfire roasting s'mores. Well, they would sit around the campfire, presumably, working their tools, telling stories, cooking food, right? And so most of what we find is this chip stone debris, this scattering of stone tooling work. Very few real artifacts that are of this kind of stature. So I think we're up most of the way to paradise now. Let's get off the bus and let's mosey out the Nisqually Vista Trail. On a good day, this is what we're looking at. We are looking right up the throat of the Nisqually Valley. We are looking right up toward the Nisqually Glacier. And I want you to notice this huge U-shaped valley. Can you imagine it carved by glaciers over thousands of years and ice and snow hundreds and hundreds of feet high above our heads? That would have been the scene thousands of years ago. So here is the beginnings of the river and the beginnings of our trip down the watershed. Here's a close up. And again, the river. And so all of this, if you can see my pointer, all of this is the tongue or the terminus, the toe of the Nisqually Glacier. Even though it looks like dirt, that is ice and snow that is covered by debris, rock debris. All right. So I would really be remiss if we started here and we didn't talk a little bit about uh, glacial retreat and climate change at Mount Rainier. So I'm going to share with you a couple of photographs that will bring into stark relief the, the notion of climate change in, in starting with glacial retreat at Mount Rainier. 
This is a photograph that was taken over 100 years ago, and I've inserted the yellow star here to give you a point of reference, all right? The next photo is going to compare uh, these two spots. The photos were taken from the exact same location, a little over 100 years apart. So here it is, notice the extent of the glacial coverage, side to side and coming down toward us. Compare that with this recent photo. Check it out again, from here to here. Pretty dramatic, I think. Another way to look at it is at this image, and each of these years correlates with the extent of the terminus of the Nisqually Glacier at that particular year. So let's dig in a little bit. I was born in 1954. That would have put the terminus of the Nisqually Glacier about here. If I use the scale at the bottom of the map, I can pretty easily estimate that in my lifetime, the Nisqually Glacier has retreated up the river valley about a mile, just in my lifetime. And the bigger takeaway is that the glacier has retreated over two miles in less than 200 years. If you look in the bottom left portion of the map, you'll see the Nisqually Paradise Road. That is where the road crosses the bridge that I showed you the photograph of. That at one time in the 1840s, the glacier actually extended beyond where today's bridge and road are. And the biggest takeaway is that all of Mount Rainier's glaciers are at their historic minimums. That means that since record keeping began over 100 years ago, all of the glaciers at Mount Rainier have retreated the furthest up the mountainside. And one of the most uh, startling things th that I've heard from the park geologists was uh, when Paul Kennard said in a workshop that we've lost eight glaciers in my lifetime. Now, Paul Kennard is not Yoda old. I mean, he's like, he's like me old, okay? Uh, eight glaciers in a lifetime to lose uh, seems, seems like a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, we also have lost the fabled uh, paradise ice caves. These wonders of nature whew, were a series of uh, ice tunnels at the foot of the Paradise Glacier, and the last of these disappeared in the uh, early 1990s. So I think that gives you a little sense for uh, some of the climate change at Mount Rainier. We're gonna, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. From here, at the uh, let's hop over about a mile southeast of the uh, beginnings of the river. Let's hop up to Paradise. And these are the flower fields, these beautiful, incredible subalpine meadows uh, that are at their beautiful bounty uh, for a few weeks, usually in August. Uh, some of the finest flower fields anywhere in the world. And um, so one of the big draws, many people come to Mount Rainier just to see the flowers in the summertime. You might know that the University of Washington has been doing some interesting research uh, for some years on plots of wildflowers. And what they're finding is that some wildflowers are now opening earlier in the season and staying open for longer periods of time than in prior years. This kind of a reassembly of the, of the plant communities, if you will. And this sounds like good news to, to a visitor, longer, longer viewing season. But when you consider that these plants depend on pollinators like bumblebees, other insects, uh, two species of hummingbirds, uh, Rufus and Calliope hummingbird, and that these are very intricate patterns that have evolved, right, of uh, relationship of uh, pollinating these plants. If that gets thrown out of kilter, we're not real sure what that's going to mean, but there are instances where that's happened in other locations, and it hasn't been good news for plants or pollinators. So all of these draws to paradise, these beautiful flower fields, uh, in incredible uh, uh, wildlife, fantastic views, has brought people. And, and with people has brought amenities. Uh, did you know that there was a rope tow at Mount Rainier for over 40 years? People could downhill ski at uh, paradise. Uh, there was even a short-lived golf course for one or two seasons. Uh, people could camp in the meadow uh, on purpose uh, back in the day. And probably one of the biggest causes of damage in the meadows 
was actually the pony rides. Uh, these left trenches like two feet deep and 10 feet wide for like 30 years after the last horse left paradise. But, but the good news of all that human impact is that it really pivoted for a fantastic series of restoration projects at Paradise. And what happened was that folks at North Cascades National Park had proven that a greenhouse could grow native plants and then propagate them and put them back into the field. And they would, they would take root, they would grow, they would thrive. So Mount Rainier followed suit, started a greenhouse program. And these are folks here in these photos that are volunteers uh, that most years, not last year, of course, with the pandemic, not so much, but most years, hundreds of people volunteer thousands of hours at Mount Rainier, putting these uh, native plants uh, into the ground. And I got to tell you, uh, Evergreen students and faculty and staff have put loads and loads of plants in the ground uh, at Paradise, at Sunrise, and other locations at Mount Rainier. And this is also a call out for folks who, if you are inclined to deepen your relationship with the mountain. Uh, volunteer work is a fantastic way to do it. So as students, you have an opportunity to be an intern during the summer, but anyone can volunteer at a whole variety of capacities to volunteer at Mount Rainier. And it's easy to find, just go to, go to their website and find the volunteer page and uh, they'll get you connected. So the other neat thing that the park realized when they, they figured out that they could uh, <clears throat> raise native plants, get them in the ground, revegetate the meadows. They also found out through trial and error that the best way to keep people on the trails and to keep them from trampling the meadows was the presence of uniformed personnel. So they invented the Meadow Rover program. And these are volunteers. Most of these folks are, you know, retired teachers or, you know, folks like that, that like, like to be out with people. And they spend the summer cruising the trails, interacting with visitors, helping them understand the fragile nature of the meadows. So that completes our time at Paradise. So back on the bus, everybody, we're gonna cruise down the hill a little bit. I wanna take a quick stop at a place just above the Cougar Rock Campground. So can you see the car on the roadway in the left hand of the photograph here? Okay. So there's the roadway. You are looking at uh, the run out of Van Trump Creek. Van Trump Creek empties into the Nisqually River. So obviously it's, it's in the Nisqually watershed. When the engineers built the road 100 years ago, the road was about 30 feet higher than the creek bed. And you obviously, even from this photograph, you can tell it doesn't look like 30 feet anymore. In fact, there are places where the creek bed is higher than the roadway. Now, the reason for that is this normal ecological process called aggradation. These glacially sourced creeks and rivers and Van Trump Creek uh, flows from the Van Trump glaciers and they carry sediment with them. You know what glaciers do, they grind the rock beneath them, right? So sediment gets suspended in the water, it gets carried away, normal ecological process and accumulated at about four inches per decade in most of Mount Rainier's rivers throughout most of the 20th century. Then Scott Beeson, park geologist, made a pretty startling discovery when his data showed him that in a lot of places, the rivers were actually averaging 36 inches of accumulated sediment in a 10 year period, an increase by a factor of nine. Holy cow, how does that happen? Well, if you think of the ice and snow in the upper mountain, kind of like the glue, that holds this rock material together, these glacial moraines together. And as that ice and snow breaks up, deteriorates, gives way, larger and larger quantities of material are going to be available for downslope movement. That's exactly what happened here at Van Trump Creek. A series of debris flows brought down tons of water and ice and snow and rock material and dumped it here. Now, think about that. When you have those events happen, and then you have heavy rainfall the next winter, where does the water go? Well, there's not as much room for the water because you've taken up space with all this rock material. And an example of that was in 2006, the tremendous floods 
at Mount Rainier, uh, the park picked up about 18 inches of rain in a day and a half. And this is a photograph at the Longmire maintenance area where you can see that the river just ravaged through the maintenance area, did a lot of damage, almost washed the emergency command center down river. Uh, that would have made the news. So what we have is now some extended effects of climate change. So increased rates of aggradation, higher flood incidence of flooding here that we have. And the other thing that happens is that as that glue on the upper mountain breaks up, we can have these sudden spontaneous releases of ice and snow and rock and other debris come down in the form of either a debris flow, like I mentioned at Van Trump Creek, or what is also known as a glacial outburst flood. And one of the areas where these are really happening with increased frequency is as you and I are now moving past Longmire, heading toward the park entrance, we're just about ready to leave Mount Rainier National Park. This is up the west side road at Tahoma Creek. What time, at one time, was a very narrow, mild-mannered creek. Can you see these ghost trees here, this ghost forest, these dead trees? They didn't grow up in the creek. They grew up at the creek side, and the creek, through a series of debris flows, over 30 in the last 60 years, have come tearing down there and bringing with them millions of yards of debris that eventually em empties into the Nisqually River. And how much is 30 million cubic yards? Well, I had a little time on my hands and I did some math. Turns out that's enough to fill two lines of dump trucks, bumper to bumper, from wherever you're at, uh, if you're in Western Washington, pretty much all the way to New York City. So a lot of material down to Homa Creek, into the Nisqually River, and think about that material all has to go somewhere, and that somewhere in many cases is into Puget Sound. Well, to Homa Creek, you can see that all the debris here, and the creek got wider and wider as it just tried to deal with all this added volume. Park became really concerned that it was going to completely destroy the West Side Road. Now, the West Side Road is closed to vehicles, uh, like visitors, like you and me, but it's needed to be open so that like emergency crews can get up and down uh, the west side of the park. So they did a, a, a pretty crazy groundbreaking, pun intended, uh, project where they brought in excavators. This is sitting on the west side road. The creek is here to your left, all right? And they dug out and then inserted these monstrous log bundles, these things are, are marvels of nature. What they do when the flow is restored, they slow down the flow of the water. And that allows the water to drop some of its sediment load. And if you can imagine that changing the grade of the riverbed, the creek bed, Tahoma Creek, actually will slope the creek and move it away from the river. These things really work, it's amazing. On this project, in addition to that, and here's, here's a couple of log bundles. Can you see this one here? Here's another log bundle, some log bundles here. The other thing that crews did, what these folks are doing is they're installing a willow wattle. And these are stakes of uh, alder and willow that have grown up and help to stabilize the earth here. And keep the, hopefully keeping the creek, and they're working, this is some years later now, keeping the creek away from the road, and at the same time building up the, the road, the side of the roadbed here with vegetation. So back on the bus, we're gonna roll out of the park. Uh, as we do, just check this out. This was again, November, 2006, real close to the Nisqually entrance of the park. And uh, I think this employee is probably wondering where is, the Sunshine Point Campground, uh, because it used to be right here. And <laughs> truth is, it got washed down uh, the Nisqually River uh, over his right shoulder. More evidence of uh, effects of, of climate change manifested in a high water events and flooding, increased flooding events. So let's leave the park. We've been here, all right? And our next stop is going to be Eatonville. You see that? So let's, uh, let's
let's cruise down to Eatonville. And along the way, let's make sure that we take note of the Mount Rainier Gateway. That's about 2,500 acres of varied habitat that is preserved in perpetuity. Also the largest uh, community owned forest in the state, the Nisqually Community Forest. Both of these are projects of the Nisqually Land Trust who are uh, really active in the watershed. They, they steward, actually, Jeff, they don't steward 7,000 acres anymore. Uh, they uh, recently, uh, with the Nisqually tribe, uh, purchased another 2,200 acres. And so now the land trust stewards uh, over 9,000 acres, protecting about three fourths of the shoreline of the Nisqually River. What that means is, is that people will not be able to build, whether it's homes or condos or resorts, along three-fourths of the Nisqually River shoreline. That's a pretty fantastic achievement. They've done a lot of that work with the Nisqually River Council. These organizations are in close contact and close work with each other. The council is the oldest river council west of the Mississippi River. And man, they have so many partners. They have such good long tentacles reaching into so many groups to work together. They can do a ton of projects and they have. And I wanna show you a few of those. So let's check out a couple in Eatonville. This is a, a project at Smallwood Park that went in uh, uh, along the Michelle River, I believe, to combat erosion and flooding. And these biologists are checking out these structures, which are called engineered log jams. Each of these logs is buried into the ground by an excavator, probably about 20 feet or more into the ground. So these are not going anywhere. Then the excavator dumps all this extra debris, root wads and other debris into the structure. And it does the same kind of function as the log bundles up on the west side road. Slows down the flow, drops uh, sediment, and tilts the, the grade of the riverbed so that the water will actually start to move away from uh, whatever it is that they need to protect. Engineered log jams are great for habitat as well. And that's why these biologists are probably here because these are nice quiet places for salmonids to uh, hide out, to rest, to feed. Another cool project uh, in, in Eatonville at Ohop Creek. And I can't tell you how many uh, evergreen field trips have gone to this spot. I can't tell you how many evergreen students and faculty have planted uh, the native plants that you see across the creek there with the white sleeves. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plants have gone into the ground uh, at this site because of uh, work, good work from the Evergreen State College. Right in the foreground here is an engineered log jam that was inserted. And what happened was back in the late 1800s, uh, I believe it was Swedish immigrants came in. They wanted to be dairy farmers like they had been in the old country. They uh, basically took the meander out of Ohop Creek. They straightened it to speed it up to drain the area. It was good news for the dairy farms, but it was terrible news for the Salmonid populations. And I think about 2009 is when the Nisqually tribe and a whole host of partners uh, basically restored the historic meander, uh, put the slow back into Old Hop Creek and uh, uh, put in the log jams. Now, many of those native plants across the way have grown up throwing shade on the water so that you get the cooler temperatures that are more conducive to, to salmon traffic. Neat project. So let's scoot. Uh, let's get back on the bus. We've been in Eatonville. Let's take a big hop down to here. Let's go to Joint Base Lewis McCord. You good with that? Now, that is, as you know, uh, Joint Base, US Army and US Air Force also happens to be a place where tons of greeners work in the sciences, doing some amazing work there. Yeah, maybe you knew that. And also some good internships for students at Joint Base Lewis McCord. I'll call it JBLM, or maybe I'll slip a couple times and call it Jablam. Anyway, what's great about Joint Base Lewis McCord is it has this. So we are in the Nisqually watershed. We're at Joint Base Lewis McCord. This is some of the best remaining prairie oak ecosystem in North America. This once stretched from Canada all the way to Oregon, hundreds of miles. 
And because of development, as you can imagine, we've lost almost all of it. A little bit remains. And as you can also imagine, because we've lost so much of the original prairies, been a huge impact on the plant and animal communities. My last count, there were about 46 species of plants that were on various state and federal endangered, threatened watch lists, those sorts of things. Over half the bird species have had their populations uh, reduced, they've had their range reduced, or some species have been extirpated altogether from the prairies. So the, obviously the idea is, oh my gosh, stop. How are we going to preserve what's left? We've got to keep what we got and maybe we can build some of the fragments back up. And if you don't know the answer to this question, it might be shocking that the best way to preserve the prairies, believe it or not, is to allow training activities to continue. Now, I know that seems counterintuitive, but when you, can, when you consider that, you know, strip malls and housing developments are going to destroy the prairies, and when you consider that many of the native prairie plants respond really well to low intensity fires. So then the shells that cause some of these small fires is actually quite good for a lot of these native plants. It's really the best thing going in terms of preserving the prairies. So as I mentioned, a bunch of greeners work at uh, JBLM and they're right at ground zero for some really neat projects. Let's take a look at a couple while we're here. This is just a beautiful stained glass window of a butterfly, Taylor's checker spots. These were once abundant on the prairies. Now they're found at fewer than a dozen locations. So they're not a lot. Uh, they're not doing great. But the good news is they've got a shot. And what's happened is that an amazing project between uh, the Department of Corrections and our Evergreen State College created the Sustainability in Prisons Project. And in this case, incarcerated people have raised over 18,000 larvae and Taylor's checker spot butterflies in a rearing facility at a women's facility in Belfair, Washington. 18,000 that are later released, these larvae and adults are later released into the prairies. And when I visited the facility, it was apparent right away that the butterflies were affecting the people as much as the people were affecting the butterflies. One of the women looked at me and she said, it makes me feel so good to work here. She said, I, I, I feel like a person. And she said, it makes me feel like the best is yet to come for them, the butterflies, and for us. Pretty powerful stuff. Another neat project uh, concerns the streaked horned lark. This is one of the subspecies of horned lark. This is, as you can see, a, a, a bird that's smaller than a robin. This is a prairie bird. Uh, biologists became concerned because they found out that, man, these birds aren't hatching. They're not hatching their eggs. Uh, and when they do hatch, there are not many uh, young birds are being recruited into the adult population. They have a low fledging rate. What's going on? They put it all together and they figured out that what was going on was inbreeding, basically, low genetic diversity. So, uh, so what the biologists did was they hatched a plan. That's a pun alert. They hatched a plan, what they called the genetic rescue project. And in my mind, a genetic rescue project, that's just fancy language for uh, elaborate kidnapping plot, okay? Because here's what they do. They find a robust population of street torn larks, like down at Corvallis at the airport. These birds will re-nest up to four or five times in a season. So if they get their nest stolen or damaged or predated, they will rebuild a new nest. So biologists said, well, hey, let's just go down to Corvallis, work with the biologists down there. Let's steal a nest with eggs in it early in the morning in the breeding season, bring it up to Jablam, put it in the Nisqually prairies in the area where we know we have a breeding pairs that ha maybe haven't built a nest yet. And let's see if they will adopt that nest in those eggs as their own. Son of a gun, it works. It really works. So this is, this is Tremaine and she doesn't, that's not lasagna. It's not an evergreen potluck. That is a plug-in incubator. Yeah, 
a plug-in incubator. She's just returned from like, was it four hour drive from Corvallis. And inside, if everything goes well, here's what you get inside the incubator. One uh, streaked horned lark nest with eggs, three to five eggs is kind of the usual. And if things really go well, what you get eventually is you get a clutch of eggs hatched and now babies, baby streak torn larks. And this was a super productive female, this clutch here. See if you can figure out if you can count all the bird beaks to see how many birds are in this clutch. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, six streak torn larks. Doing pretty good. She did a pretty good job, didn't she? So before we leave the, the larks, need to introduce you to Brian. He's one of the rock stars of the project. Check out his bracelets. Um, he's got two on each leg. So he's had a lot of contact with researchers. And uh, I should mention that Adrian Wolf, uh, who's done so much work with street torn larks, of course, he's an evergreen graduate, right? Uh, until recently worked for the Conservation for Natural Lands Management and was a great help to me in my research on this part of the project. So Brian's cool, this bird, because he was one of the translocated birds egg that came up from Oregon. He hatched, fledged, and returned to Joint Base lewis McCord at least three years to breed and to raise young. So he has helped increase the genetic diversity at Joint Base lewis McCord. Some other cool things they're doing there, they're getting people on the ground to search for nests. So this nest finding, when they communicate the location, GPS location of the nests to people who manage the airfields or to people who plan the training exercises, then they can redirect the activities so that the nests are not imperiled any longer. And this has had a remarkable effect just in eight years, it's increased the pairs at the McCord Field up to 50. And on the prairie, the native prairie, it's increased from 12 to 40 pairs. So some really good things are going on for the street torn lark at Joint Base Lewis McCord. Now, some other projects are more uh, what you call system wide. So we've just looked at a couple of projects that are related to just specific species. Let's take a look at Scott's broom or Scotch broom. This is what I like to think of as an old growth forest. A photograph taken here by Adam Martin, a student of mine at Evergreen, a great biologist in his own right, has done a lot of work at JBLM. And, um, you know, how do you get rid of Scotch broom? Well, it's really hard. This stuff is so pernicious, so persistent. So one of the things they do they mow and mow and mow and mow. They may use pesticides. And the other thing they do is they use prescribed burns. See, Scott's broom is not a prairie native and it does not respond well to fire. In fact, it burns like crazy. So what crews have done is adopting in basically an ancient Native American practice of using fire on the prairies to keep out the plants they want to get rid of and to keep the other plants going that are good uh, fire resistant or that respond well to low intensity fires like the prairie natives. Crews are averaging about 1800 acres a year in the last decade of burning. And here in the foreground, taking care of some Scott's broom, uh, taking care of some Douglas fir in the background. And of course, Doug fir is native to this area, but it's not a native prairie plant. So left to incurs, uh, to, to, to come onto the prairies, Doug fir will just turn it into a Doug fir forest. So the idea is to keep those plants out of there as well. The other thing hand in hand with the prescribed burns is a, another piece of work from the Sustainability in Prisons Project. So this is the this is the collaboration between the Department of Corrections and Evergreen. These incarcerated people raise native plants that are then put out into the prairies uh, around Mount Rainier and in the Nisqually watershed. They've done some amazing work. They have figured out how to raise over 80 different species of native plants. They've grown over 2 million plants in their nursery program. And again, this is Evergreen doing good work with the DOC through Sustainability in Prisons Project. The plant here in the foreground is, uh, what's this? 
one of the paintbrushes. Is it a harsh paintbrush? I can't remember. Anyway, it's one of the paintbrushes that is protected under the Endangered Species Act. They raise, they've raised that there too. So let's go, let's go ahead and start to wrap things up, eh? We've been down here at Joint Base Lewis McCord. Let's hop back on the bus one more time for a short trip. Let's go down to the refuge. Let's take a look at this incredible, incredible ecosystem at the Nisqually River Delta. So we've got I-5 in the foreground here. To your left or to the south would be uh, all points south, including uh, Lacey, Olympia, uh, Evergreen, Tumwater, et cetera. And to the right, to the north would be up toward uh, Seattle and Tacoma. So we're looking at the Nisqually Estuary. This is where saltwater and freshwater mix. This incredible journey makes some of the most productive ecosystems on earth. In just a, a, a square yard or a square meter of mud and muck, we could find thousands and thousands and thousands of organisms. And this is also one of the best remaining examples of salt marsh habitat uh, in, the, uh, in the United States. So if we were to take a look at the Delta over the ages, back before people, we might think of it as being something that would be close to what might be considered its natural condition. That is, without influence from people's presence. And then the Nisqually villages some thousands of years ago, uh, European American settlers coming into the area in the mid 1800s. Uh, Medicine Creek was renamed McAllister Creek, the McAllister family, other families settled in the mid 1800s. And then on a dismal December day in 1854, uh, signatories of the Nisqually, Squaxin, Puyallup, uh, and other tribal groups, as Irick mentioned in his beautiful acknowledgement at the beginning, they uh, these signatories ceded over 4,000 square miles of land to the federal government in exchange for their uh, preserving the right to hunt, fish, and gather in their usual in accustomed locations. So this area is important in so, so many ways. And here is just one of the cultural linchpins of this area, the, the signing of the Treaty of Medicine Creek here on the Delta. And then uh, things were largely unchanged, unchanged for another 50 years or so until Seattle lawyer Alston Brown uh, bought several thousand acres of land at the Delta. And his idea was to build an industrial farm. One of the first things he did was hired a crew and uh, a horse-drawn uh, crew. And what they did was they, they, they created a huge dike. They wanted to keep the water out. They wanted to drain the land inside so that it would be good for farming. And uh, well, it did the job, but what it also did was it cut the Nisqually River off from its traditional pathways into Puget Sound. And of course, you know what that's gonna do to the salmon stocks, right? Decimate it completely. So Brown's farm failed not too much later, but the effects proliferated for a hundred years until the area got a huge break in the 1970s when it was designated as the Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. And that made pretty interesting. It made this one of the few rivers, maybe the only, some people say, one of the few rivers that begins in a national park and ends in a national wildlife refuge. Pretty cool stuff. And have to mention, of course, that the education uh, manager at Nisqually at the refuge, uh, none other than Davy Clark, uh, an evergreen graduate, who when he finished his internship at uh, the refuge, he refused to leave. And he had done such good work, they had to find a job for him. So this is 10 years later, and Davy Clark still uh, manages all the school groups that come uh, to enjoy the refuge. So uh, the other huge thing that happened in 2009, again, the Nisqually tribe with a host of uh, partners raised the money, got the permits together to actually remove the Browns Farm Dyke. And so what they did was they had ex excavators move in and sometimes you got to make a mess to make things right, right? They removed over five miles of dike. They restored hundreds of acres of estuary and reconnected the Nisqually 
river to its outflow into the Puget Sound. Here's a couple of photographs like a before and afters, all right? I've circled the uh, barns here, so you have kind of a point of reference. But the area I want you to look at is right here, okay? This is with the dike still in place, rivers to your right, uh, and then flowing out into Puget Sound to your left. So here's the before, and here's the after. And notice now the pathways that have been created as the dike is being removed. And this was pretty early in the game. I'm told that there's tons more debris and sediment that moved out into the sound and that there's even more pathways uh, between the river and into Puget Sound. So with that, I think we can say that, you know, maybe some of this, the delta and the estuary here, again, is starting to maybe move back toward kind of more toward its natural condition. Probably pretty good news. So as we're getting back on the bus and we're starting to wrap things up, I've got some questions here for you, just so that you can kind of land on what I think are some of the main ideas, all right? So why don't you take a look at these and see what you think? Uh, these are about the presence of native people. Uh, this is a true and false. There were several year-round Nisqually tribal villages within the present boundaries of Mount Rainier National Park. True or false? No, that's false, remember? Lots of villages along the river, but no year-round year villages within park boundaries. And villages were spread along the river throughout much of the watershed. True or false? Yeah, that's the truth. Here comes a multiple choice. Most physical evidence of the presence of Native Americans at Mount Rainier is in the form of chipstone debris from tool making and maintenance, B, projectile points, blades and scrapers, C, cedar baskets, D, fire hearth at ancient camps. Most evidence? Most evidence is A, chipstone debris from tool making and maintenance. And number four, again, multiple choice, Native Americans went to Mount Rainier for a variety of reasons. The most common was probably for spiritual religious purposes, to gather resources not available near their lowland villages, to play bone games and race horses, to meet and trade with relatives. And actually there's evidence that people did all of these things uh, at the mountain, but the most common is probably gathering resources. All right, let's take a look at a few questions that have to do with climate change. All of Mount Rainier's glaciers have retreated the furthest up the mountain slopes since record keeping began. True or false? That is true. Blank is the accumulation of sediment in the beds of glacially sourced rivers. Is that A, aggravation, B, scouring, C, debris flows, or D, aggradation? Answer is aggradation. Number seven, geologic hazards at Mount Rainier associated with climate change include more earthquakes, debris flows, and flooding. More debris flows and more melted ice cream. I think that's your throwaway. C, more debris flows, glacial outburst floods, and flooding. Or D, more earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and debris flows. Best answer here would be more debris flows, glacial outburst floods, and flooding. And finally, which of these is not a current restoration project in the Nisqually watershed? A, engineered log jams. B, dam decommissioning and removal. C, prescribed prairie burns. D, species specific and ecosystem scale projects. One of these is not on the current docket, and that is dam decommissioning and removal. So as we begin to wrap things up and back on the bus and taking you back to your place to debark and disembark and head back into our, the rest of our day, I often think about the Nisqually and I think of all the people, the thousands of hours, the dozens of projects, the, all the sweat, all the hard work that's gone into uh, making this really a watershed that is a, a national model, award-winning in terms of preservation, conservation projects, 
partnerships. It's remarkable. And, and I, I always come home to the, you know, one person that I think of that really kind of embodies the spirit, the grit, uh, the determination that really best personifies, you know, the Nisqually watershed. And who, who better, who better could that be, right, than, than Billy Frank Jr.? Uh, uh, we know him uh, in so many ways, uh, uh, a leader, an activist at the uh, local, state, regional, federal levels. I believe he was on the board of trustees at the Evergreen State College for a number of years, wasn't he? Uh, uh, right, rightfully so, uh, awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That's the highest uh, uh, honor that, that a, a, a citizen can receive uh, from uh, President Obama. And just recently, uh, you might have caught this in the news, uh, his statue is going to be inserted representing Washington State in the National Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol. So it was, it was very all very right, I think, that uh, after Billy's death, the refuge was renamed in his name and in his honor for all of the work, all the collaborating and, and cooperating that he'd done in his life. And I think to, to, to put a cap on things, uh, for me, one of my favorite Billy Frank quotes is this. He said, I don't believe in magic. I believe in the sun and the stars, the water, the tides, the floods, the owls, the hawks flying, the river running, the wind talking, their measurements. They tell us how healthy things are, how healthy we are, because we and they are the same. That's what I believe in. Those who listen to the world that sustains them can hear the message brought forth by the sound. And just a quick public service announcement. If you like a copy of the book, pretty easy to get, probably or even copies in the bookstore at Evergreen or uh, otherwise, you can get them from me or any of, support your independent bookstore for Pete's sakes, right? And I wanna really thank you for uh, coming with me on this virtual field trip. I've certainly enjoyed it. I hope you have. Really looking forward to the question and answer session. So let's get on with that and uh, turn it back to, uh, Turn it back to you, uh, Eric and Rachel. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeff. Truly uh, an incredible, incredible field trip that you've taken us on. I'm, I'm finding a link to your um, to your webpage that I'll share in the chat here. I see a few, um, at least one question has come in. I also found a link for um, volunteer opportunities at the park. The thing I like least about Zoom is that we can't clap. We can't give you that gale of enthusiastic response. Um, thank you so much, Jeff. Truly a, a beautiful survey, but also I think a demonstration of the, the interdisciplinary um, the interdisciplinary inquiry that we that we celebrate and and learn so much from your your coverage of cultural history, natural history, geomorphology, engineering, restoration, remediation, regeneration, and much, much more um, are absolutely inspiring. One, one comment that's come in is um, uh, a remark that says, this talk was totally enthralling. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. Thanks for that remark. And I would just invite others who are here to post any comments or questions that you might have into the Q and A. Um, and as you as you do your typing, um, I'll maybe just pose one question um, to to Jeff, which is um, a, a question about the volcano itself, the volcanic properties of this, of this neighbor of ours. And I'll just share a brief story. I took a photograph of Tahoma from uh, just above the Fourth Avenue Bridge in, um, in Olympia. And I, I sent it to my nephew who lives in Ann Arbor. And he wrote back right away. He said, cool mountain, where's the top? Because it had that trapezoid shape, and so I just, I just wanted to invite you to maybe offer any any comments about the the volcanic properties of this astonishing neighbor that we have. Uh, Irik, I've got a good question here from Jason. Great. Yeah, he wants to know about those about all those endangered plant species. What can what for Pete's sakes can we do about it? And uh, can I see the list? Uh, lives uh, lives on Scatter Creek. 
And uh, he says this property has a fair amount of wildflowers and plants. Is there any way that I can help spread them? And um, yeah, there's got to be a way that we got to get got to get you connected, uh, Jason, to the folks that uh, that do some of that restoration work uh, in the area. Um, you know, uh, also a uh, member of the faculty at Evergreen, Frederica Bocut, has done a substantial uh, uh, amount of work and research and writing and educating on uh, the prairie plants. Um, she might be one person to start with. That's Frederica Boca. Um, I know with a, a I, I don't have it at my fingertips, Jason, but I know with it with a little bit of research, you can get connected to some of the organizations that are working on behalf of these prairie plants. I know that the Washington Native Plant Society is one, and uh, and you could probably uh, oh, as a matter of fact. The Washington Native Plant Society now has a program for people to become basically a steward of native plants. So if you wanted to learn more and how to propagate them and restore them, you might check out uh, their website, Washington Native Plant Society. Well, Excellent. And I, yeah, thank you. I, I also, I just want to point out, you know, it's, it's good to see uh, names of folks that I, that I know from my time. Uh, working at the college. So it's good to see Link. It's good to see Meredith on board. Uh, one of our interns for this summer who will be working at Mount Rainier this summer, uh, Randy, is, is on board today. So uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the talk and start to get your feet on the ground, Randy, uh, regarding the mountains. So uh, up for any more questions, we've got plenty of time. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Jeff, for lifting that question up. There's a question about um, the ways in which we um, describe the, the terrain. So this is the last question that's been posted. Why separate the human Nisqually presence from the river delta's natural condition if the restoration efforts in effort to restore the natural condition are native Nisqually methods? It seems like humans are a part of the natural condition of the Delta, just oh, not colonizing settler humans. Oh, nice. Gracie, you just knocked it like right out of the park on that one. Um, great question. And I, really, you give me something to think about because that <clears throat> that wheel that, that I that I designed, that I shared with you, kind of that the, the estuary through the ages, that was all pretty subjective on my part, to be honest, you know, just kind of thinking about my understanding of the, of the estuary in the area. And uh, I, I want to hang on to your to your question and, and why separate the human presence from the natural condition? That's that's a really good question and a point well taken. And I, I don't have a straight comeback for that, except to say that's worth me giving some thought to that part of the talk. So thank you. One thing that stood out for me, Jeff, you were you had that wonderful moment with the with the map of the glacier itself, and you were able to timestamp it relative to your own um, to your own life, um, stamping back to the the date of of your birth and showing us that about a mile has retreated. It also occurs to me that the age of evergreen is another measure. We're about to celebrate our fiftieth birthday, and in 1971, um, those dikes weren't removed. And the, the amount of, of um, uh, waterfront that you've that you've um, drawn our attention to was not put in conservation, and the restoration efforts hadn't occurred, and the wildlife refuge itself hadn't been established. That happened after the Bolt decision in 1974, or con con concurrent with the Bolt decision. And so I think as we're imagining the devastating consequences of climate change, we can also think about some of the other um, influences that um, have, have contributed to the restoration of, of this landscape. And I yeah. think what, what's beautiful about your book is the way you balance um, some, of, some of the hard news with some of the more um, promising and, and powerful news. I've got a I've got another question here I can take, and I also want to want to give a shout out to one of those tenacious reference librarians, uh, Paul McMillan, uh, is in on the call. So hello, Paul, glad you're here, and uh, make sure you read the acknowledgments because I'm pretty sure you're in there. Yeah, Paul was a big help in some of my research back in the day. Here's the question uh, from one of the uh, one of the texts. Does the watershed drain into Puget Sound, and if so, does climate change? 
whoops, it just jumped on me. And so does climate change effect on glacier melt eventually precipitate sea level rise in the SeaTac region? A super good question, you're spot on. So uh, first part of the question, does the watershed drain into Puget Sound? The answer is yes. So the Nisqually, the Nisqually River drains into Puget Sound, as I said, at, uh, uh, at the estuary there, uh, which is now the, uh, the Billy Frank, Junior Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. Because of the increases in aggradation uh, that is melting and the increases in sediment being carried by these glacially sourced rivers, meaning the Nisqually, we're getting about a million tons of sediment from the mountain dumped into Puget Sound every year. Now a million tons, I did the math, <clears throat> a million tons would be a building as tall as the Space Needle, if you can imagine that, which is at 650 feet or whatever that is, as tall as the Space Needle with a footprint the size of a football field. Fill that every year, uh, that's a million tons of sediment that's dumping into Puget Sound from Mount Rainier's rivers, from the Nisqually. So yes, does does that does that have an effect? Well, you're right. So over time, what we're doing is we're you know we're seeing that more and more sediment is being released into Puget Sound, and does that contribute at least in some small way to sea level rise? I would love to have one of my favorite geologists on board to have them talk more about that, uh, but it seems like that would be the case. <clears throat> There's more comments coming in. Students are finding copies of your book. So copies are in the mail. Um, and there's another comment from Meredith. Fantastic. I had no idea so much was going on to restore habitat. I learned so much. So great to hear the important role Evergreen has in this. And then we've got a question that just got posted um, that, that draws our attention to um, other watersheds that you might be able to um, speak to us about. Jeff, so what about the Deschutes River and Capitol Lake? What's going on with the estuary that is downtown Olympia? And so of course that's a separate watershed, but do you have any perspective or um, response to that query? Thank you, Ruth. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, I don't really know the latest on that. There's probably somebody here uh, you know, on on this talk today, who probably knows is a little more current uh, th than I am regarding that. So I, I won't, you know, I, I won't go, I don't have any detail to go into, but uh, Irik is right, a different watershed. Uh, Capital Lake was uh, uh, created by people, right? It's an artificial lake. Uh, th there's been moves to remove it. I don't know what the status of that is to kind of restore some of the, the natural, if you will, uh, essence to that area. But I, I really don't know any more than that. If we've got an expert on that, uh, please put some information into the chat feature so we can share that out with folks. Absolutely right. So I can actually contribute into the chat um, a book project that um, our colleagues Zoltan Grossman and Alex McCarthy have been working on, um, focused specifically on a number of watersheds in the South Sound region. That, that book is not quite available, but I think any day it should be available here at sites.evergreen.edu slash removing barriers. This was a text produced by Evergreen students in collaboration with, um, with two of our colleagues. So there might be more information there about, um, about that, particular, that particular watershed. Um, well, what about the volcano, Jeff? Hook me up. What can you tell us about the, the volcanic activity of this amazing neighbor that here's, we have? Here, here's the good news. <clears throat> here's the good news. It's not going to blow its lid uh, like Mount St. Helens, right? The, to their first cousins. They're only 50, 60 miles apart, Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier, all along the spine of the Cascades. Uh, they're close relatives, but they have different magmatic properties. Uh, Mount St. Helens is more prone to these buildups of uh, lava domes and these sudden, explosive, violent lateral eruptions, kablooey. 
It's like the roommate who is just quiet all the time until one day I accidentally left a cup of water on their desk and they went ballistic, right? Um, Mount Rainier, different magmatic properties, lava flows moving slower. Um, so Mount Rainier's hazards, as I've alluded to, you know, in the talk, in addition to that, we look at the geologic record, Mount Rainier's deal are these mud flows that we now call lahars. And there's something like 60 of these that have come coursing down uh, Mount Rainier's valleys over the last 10,000 years. So a, a lahar or a mud flow is kind of like the consistency of like wet cement. If you can imagine a huge amount of wet cement moving down valley, uh, snow, ice, part of the mountain actually collapses, gives way and brings with it all of this material rushing down the river valley, flowing away from the mountain. And so if you're in high ground, no harm. However, so I, I, to get to your point, we're not as much concerned about eruptions of Mount Rainier as we are maybe concerned about the big one, that is earthquakes, and about the potential for uh, future lahars. And this is why in the Puyallup Valley, this is why the school children in Puyallup and in Sumner and in Ordon, why they regularly practice lahar evacuation drills. Because there is a huge, massive amount of rock material poised in the upper Puyallup Valley that probably someday is going to cut loose and in either one or a series of lahars is going to come rushing down the Puyallup Valley and engulf Ording, parts of Puyallup, Sumner, a Fife, Pacific, that whole area. So those folks are doing the best they can to be prepared for that eventuality in a variety of ways. Very helpful. Thank you, Jeff. Another comment that's been posted. This was incredibly informative. You kept my attention the whole time, and I'm very grateful for your talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> true, true, true feedback in, that's in awesome. Evergreen style. Uh, maybe one last question, Jeff. Um, you, you, it, it, it was beautiful the way you concluded your talk by honoring um, the legacy of Billy Frank Jr. and um, and making note of the um, um, statue that will be contributed to Statuary Hall in Washington D.C. I wonder if you could give us in the in the ninety seconds or so that we've that we've got left. I wonder if you could give us a glimpse into some of the salmon restoration projects. Mm. I know that's that's part of that's part of this history and in terms of the the, the treaty itself with with yeah. granting the right to fishing in your usual and accustomed places. Yeah. Um, might be interesting to hear a word or two on that. Well, th those projects th that are, were in the talk, so when we visited Ohop Creek uh, in the talk outside of Eatonville, there's a ton of data on the restoration of the salmon stocks there. Um, and I th and I, there's a ton of data uh, that's coming in on the removal of the dike and the restoration of the Delta area at Nisqually. So th as time goes on and as scientists have an opportunity to do more studies and to accumulate more data. We're gonna know more and more about uh, what those good effects are, much the same way that we've seen uh, with, the, uh, with the removal of the Elwha dams and the return of, of so much wildlife uh, to that watershed, much the same way uh, I think we can see the same thing with these kind of projects in the Nisqually. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jeff. So the Ohop, Ohop Creek Salmon Restoration Project, and then this amazing um, project starting in 2009 with removing the dikes, opening the river up again so yep. that the fish, the fish can make their can make their passage. Yeah. Um, well, we've, we've come to the top of our hour. I can't thank you enough, Jeff. What a beautiful field trip you took us on. How about we say to be continued with, with one of those buses or maybe a whole fleet of them in, I don't know, a few months, something like that. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your being here. Thanks again for the opportunity, Eric, Rachel, and others. Thanks for the tech team. It's really been great, folks. So thank you very much and hope to see you again sometime.